have a few slides to try to keep me on track. Um, kind of a tough act to follow there, but I'm amateur and I claim to be amateur, so it sure helps. I guess what I'm going to bring to this is a couple of things. One is our history, a little bit of our history of Farmers Union and where we came from and where we're at today and a few things in between. And um, uh, also just a little bit about my personal experience because I'm 67. You know, I signed my first contract at an ASCS office in the middle 70s. So uh, I've lived through some of these farm programs and I've seen the evolution, revolution, and all those things lying with it. Um, this particular slide, I just threw in there just for a starter, just because I, I did a presentation on um, uh, the progressives out at Rocky Mountain a few years ago. But if you look, uh, if you can't really see it, but that gentleman's reading um, the Progressive Farmer magazine, which is still in existence today, which is kind of amazing because the Progressive Farmer was actually the organ of the North Carolina Farmers Union originally. And, and uh, uh, anyway, it's newspapers and, and publications, and that's where I get all the information. So what I tell you is just what I read. I'm not a trained historian by degrees in geology. I just read a lot. I got my own microfilm machine and I've got a stack of newspapers I go to the ceiling. And uh, I'm pretty proud of them too. So, but anyway, Farmers Union, as, as Bonnie alluded to, really grew out of the ashes of the Farmers Alliance and Industrial Union. And um, the Alliance, and she, she basically talked about this how I, you know, felt the victim of partisan politics, or that's the way I see it, and disbanded. <laughs> but the, the, a lot of the, they had a lot of organizers, and that's when they organized in the early days, it was. You know, they went out and knocked on doors or went, you know, person to person, so it was real personal. And there was a, an ongoing of the sequence of it, but, but when Newt Gresham, who was one old pop or an old uh, uh, alliance guy, they decided to try to resurrect that movement, he gave it a lot of thought. And this is about 1902. And, uh, and they started in, in Texas in the South, and, and they, they worked on some very basic principles. And um, they, if you look at the old newspaper headers, and that's what people, I think, always relied on that. They wanted, when people joined a farm organization, then they'd always, there's usually a newspaper editor who was headed, headed or started a lot of times. And they'd be selling a newspaper, and people would join, and they'd say, and by the way, you're going to get this newspaper. So a lot of people just buy the newspaper. But it's very educational because, like, on the header of the newspaper, most Farmers Union papers, there were three tenets across the top. It was organize, educate, and cooperate, which grew right out of the old, old alliance uh, principles. Um, it was or they were organized around social centers, which at that time were an educational centers, which were the country schoolhouse, and that was the gathering point. Um, we. I mean, let's, let's next slide, Brian, if you can. Okay, in, that, in the progressive era, and I just pulled this slide. If you look at that a little bit close, it's hard to see, but on that gathering, that pitchfork, it says the Alliance. And then if you go down, it's got the Boodle, the three guys on the run, Boodle politicians, uh, corporate. Uh, can you read that, Brian? And the corrupt politician, yeah, the corrupt politician, and. Uh, Anyway, I, I'm sorry, I, I should know this, but, but it, it's really graphic. Of, of these people thought, well, we're going to get together and we're going to sweep these people out of the way. And they, they tried and in some cases succeeded. <clears throat> My take on this, being not a trained um, researcher at all, is that um, they, they, since they failed in politics at that one point in time, and as Bonnie said, it went up and down, they worked the cooperative movement. The cooperatives have been around quite a while, and then the Grange really started doing cooperative work. And a lot of people, and they, a lot of it went south on them. And people, so a lot of people had a bad attitude towards cooperatives because they, first of all, they didn't educate about what, how they were to function. And a lot of people were really taking advantage of. They would somebody they start a cooperative, get it going. Somebody come in and say, well. You know, you got a lot of debt. Well, they didn't realize that was on one side of the ledger, and they had an asset on the other. But there was one thing Farmers Union did in the early days, legislatively, 
they worked for uh, cooperative, good uniform cooperative law, not only on state level, but on the national level. And that really revolutionized cooperative you know, the Capital Volstead Act. And that, and that uh, I don't know if it passed out, this, this Farmers Union pamphlet's from the 70s, and you don't need to look at it now, but as you go through there, you'll see a, a, just a bunch of items that were very progressive in nature. And it wasn't directly Farm Bill related because Farm Bills didn't come around until the 20s. But all along, we've always kind of built onto and, and supported underneath ideas and principles and, and programs that would support um, rural America and, and the small person. Um, let's go to the next slide, Ryan. And I just got to kind of digress here a little bit and talk about activity. This is 1905. And, actually, and uh, this happened in, in uh, Rush County, and it, it's uh, pe the People versus Smiley and the Grain Trust. And this guy by the name of Smiley, he was uh, head of the Kansas Grain Dealers Association. He had traveled to Rush County and many other places, but anyway, they were price fixing. And, and uh, a 22 cent margin on grain, which should only be about 10 cents. Anyway, the people chased after him, and they, there was a law on the books in Kansas called Freddie's Antitrust Law. And they had the sheriff chase them all the way back to Topeka, brought them back and arrested them. Let's go to the next slide. And, and through this whole process, after he got convicted, I, like, I love the way these old papers, these old pop papers are written. It says, you know, grain secretary throws a fit, then goes to jail. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and they took great pride in this. And this is what they rallied around. In this particular case, I'll just quick tell you, was appealed to the state Supreme Court, it was upheld, went all the way to the United States Supreme Court from Rush County, Kansas, and was upheld. So, come back, they throw him in jail for like six months, <clears throat> and then he appealed to Governor Hawk, and he wanted a pardon, and over 400 people in that county, I gotta list all their names, signed a petition and sent it to the governor and said, do not let this guy out. And they did it, but they did allow him to set up his desk in his jail cell, cell and he conducted his business from the jail cell of Rush County, which is just incredible. But, but I, I, the only reason I throw this up is because people fell in power, and this was kind of the beginning of the cooperative movement, and Farmers Union and the American Society of Equity, another organization, really at that time uh, started pushing cooperatives. And the cooperatives, they would hand out little pocket-sized books of how to start a cooperative, where it be in the paper. And, and around the middle teens, uh, Kansas Farmers Union alone was responsible for over 600 cooperatives in one year starting up. It went from 1,000 cooperatives in Kansas to about 11,000 between the ASC and, and the Farmers Union, which is a real start. And, uh, and they did pretty well with that. And then, as Bonnie alluded to about the McNary Hagen, you know, the, the really first push was to do it through cooperatives because they felt like if you controlled the machinery of, of the, what you had, you controlled your destiny, which was a lot of truth. I mean, uh, the essence of, I mean, you know, ownership is really the case control. You don't have to own it, you can control it, and that's where you get to a little bit later in this discussion. So, um, one more slide. Uh, and progressive priorities of Farmers Union, this came right out of one of our handbooks, and I just highlight a few, like we supported rural free delivery and mail, the white slave law, packing houses, immigration was an issue, pure food, child labor law, cooperative stores, all these things that we were dealing with in, the, in 1920. So we were really way ahead of the time. Um, moving along, a little bit faster, I'm sorry, but we get into this farm bill evolution and, and um, Bonnie laid that out perfect about the Mary Hagen and saying, you know, that the third time it landed when things crashed and that just blew that whole cooperative thing. Because we really thought we had it going with cooperatives. We were doing, we were going to federate the cooperatives. In fact, the ownership of that was changed into where, we, man, we really had this going. Well, then the economy went to pot. Along comes the AAA program. Uh, 1933, which is, when you start studying that, I don't know, I mean, I've got a lot to learn, but you know what, the payments that, that they allocated already in 1933, that put us over parity price on a lot of our products right away, which was, which we don't have today. 
And in 1936, the AAA program was declared unconstitutional, and then it was re-entered back, and Ron, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, but with the conservation twist to it, and that's basically the basis of farm programs today is, is the conservation. conservation. Um, so I'm gonna jump forward quite a ways because I've taken quite too much time already, but you know, we moved along until 1996 when basically we deregulated agriculture with freedom to farm. And not only did we deregulate, you know, we desensitized our, our farmers to what they were doing, I believe. We, des we worked on de-skilling our farmers. A lot of different things that happened. Um, and, I, and I think about the first farm programs I signed up for in my early day. You know, we looked at target prices. We looked at all these things. We had set-asides. We had a lot of things that were very functional. We had local control because the FSA office or the AFCS office is in that county committees. And a little bit before my time, they actually set the loan rate locally in every county. So we we really had more local control. We kind of, we kind of forfeited that uh, while we did forfeit. But what's really, I think, happened with um, uh, with in farm programs is with the freedom of farm and the, and the deregulation is the fact that we've converted everything from bushels to units, or from animals to units. And now everything everything is based on the more units you have and their margin per unit. So we don't think about what we produce as a commodity or as a grain, as a food, it's a unit. And there was a lot of advantage to a lot of other interests to create units because decal sells units of corn, Monsanto sells units of chemical, units, units, units. And then I think it's unfortunate because I think a lot of a lot of farmers have fallen into that trap and economically they can't hardly get out of it. But it, it desensitizes you what you're doing out in the field, what you're doing in the in the in the, in the countryside. I'll just run down about six quick things about what I think a progressive farm farm bill should be, and these something's a little bit of pie in the sky, but, but it might be some food for thought for later discussion. Um, you know, I think one, we, we need to obviously match our production with supply, with supply. but that that match mustn't just be the, the bulk production, but we must match our production to what our environment can stand, what the commons can stand, what we can extract, what, what wealth we can capture. Um, we need to recognize and protect the commons, the things that we share in common, our water, our soil, and you know, we can't, Think of this singularly, we got to think of it collectively. Um, we need to support the value of the fruits of our labor land. You know, we got to be able to capture that wealth in our, in our community. The slide that Rob had the other day showing like 12 cents on the dollar. I have another slide I could have put up there in 1915. It was 46 cents, and we were complaining because we thought it was too little then at 46 cents. Um, you know, our, our far progressive farm bill should help create communities, and not just our town. You know, it's economic, our social community, and environmental communities. And it should, you know, be based in enforcement of antitrust laws. I mean, that's that's the only way we're going to do it. We can't compete individually against against these other interests. We don't have enough capital. Uh, we don't have enough of anything. But collectively, we can. And uh, you know we got to stop the economic, what I call economic cannibalization of our communities. I mean, the best money some of us make is what we make off our neighbors by doing custom work or selling hay, and it's just back and forth. You know, it's, I remember my dad telling a story about the guy that had a really pretty nice milk cow, and neighbor came over wanted to buy it, and, and he said, "Well, he said I really don't want to sell it, but if you really want it, I'll you know four hundred dollars." Okay. So a few days later, the guy, the other guy thought, no, I wish I wouldn't have sold that cow. So we went back and said, hey, he said, I'll give you $500 for that cow. Said, well, okay, I'll sell it back to you. And they went back the other way for another $100. And it ended up, one time the, the other neighbor went over this last time and said, well, I, I think I want that one more time. And he goes, well, I can't do that. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, I sold that cow. And the guy said, well, you idiot. He said, we were both money on that cow until you sold it to somebody else. 
<laughs> so with that, I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs> That's all I have for now. Thank you, Kevin.